How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hi, you're listening to DNA Today, a podcast and radio show where we discover new advances in the world of genetics. From genetic technology like CRISPR to rare diseases to new research, we have you covered. For a decade, DNA Today has brought you the voices of leaders in genetics. I'm Kira Deneen. I'm a certified genetic counselor and your host. Are you thinking about a career in genetic counseling? Maybe you're already a current student or even a recent grad. Then you have to head over to our social media for a major giveaway right now. We've assembled 15 genetic counselors, including myself and some other familiar faces, voices, if you catch my drift. All 15 of us are going to be mentors for lucky 15 listeners. That's right. You can meet with us for a one-hour Zoom call for a one-on-one mentoring session. This is a giveaway, so you can just go to our Instagram and Twitter and then my personal LinkedIn, Kira Deneen to enter for free. For an extra 10 entries, that's right, an extra 10 entries, you can leave a rating review on Spotify or Apple. Hey, if you want 20 extra entries, do both. Then email that to info at dnapodcast.com and I will personally give you an extra 10 entries. Again, we're gonna have 15 winners, so you've got a really good shot. If you leave a rating review, you tag some friends on social media, you share it on your Instagram story. Um, We're really, really excited for this. I am very passionate about helping people get into the genetic counseling profession. If you couldn't tell already, we have a lot of episodes about this. And just wanna give a shout out to GC Prep for being our sponsor for this giveaway. We are so excited. So head over to our social media. There's also a link in the show notes to access the giveaway. is big business, and it is rapidly changing our world. This was most evident recently with the rapid creation of mRNA COVID vaccines. Now, genetics is everywhere, from individually engineered cancer therapies to bioengineered food, and it plays a huge role in so much of what we use and consume. So we're going to get the lowdown on how our genes work and what we can expect in the future. So stay tuned. everybody, this is Chris Brandt here with Sundish Patel. Welcome to another future podcast. Now, the best way you can help this show is by subscribing. And most people who enjoy the show are not subscribed. If even a small percentage of you were to subscribe, we would be ecstatic. Today, we're talking with Kira Deneen, host of the DNA Today podcast, the two-time winner of the People's Choice Podcast Award for Best Science and Medicine Podcast. Now, have you ever wondered why calico cats look the way they do? And is there a human equivalent? What does our genetic future look like? Well, the answers might surprise you. So let's hear about it from an expert. Welcome, Kira. Hi, thank you so much for having me on. (laughs) Well, thanks for being on. I'm so excited to have this conversation. I think uh, this is super interesting stuff. Um, But before we get there, uh, could you just... Give me a little bit about your background. I mean, you've got the podcast, you're a genetic counselor, which is really fascinating in and of itself. Could you just tell us how you got from, you've been podcasting since you were in high school, right? Tell us that that whole journey and what it's like to be a genetic counselor. Ah, the whole journey. How much time do you have, Chris? Um, (laughs) At least 30 minutes. (laughs) Sounds good. (laughs) Um, So I started podcasting in high school, as Chris mentioned. So I was around 16, 17 at the time. And now I'm 27. So it's been 10 years doing this. Um, And I really got into it because I downloaded a podcast as I was going on a family trip. And then I I thought it'd be a couple minutes. And then I saw it was like an hour and a half long. I'm like, who would ever listen to an MP3 file? Because back then, that's what you were doing. It'd be really downloading files. Um, This was back 2008, something like that. I was like, who would ever listen to that for so long? That's so boring. And then I got bored and playing. And then I was like, oh, okay, actually, this is great. And it was a Harry Potter podcast. You guys will see how oh, wow. nerdy I am throughout this interview, I'm sure. And <laughs> so it starts out with Hedwig's theme on electric guitar. And I was sold. It was like a couple seconds in. I was like, this is going to be cool, whatever it is. And at the time, it was a bunch of high schoolers just talking about Harry Potter. So I was like, this is awesome. So then I was like, <laughs> I wonder if I could do this. Once I figured out they were only, you know, about five years older than me, I was like, well, maybe I could do something like this. Yeah. Um, so that's how I got involved because I just saw how unique 
podcasting is, how you can really reach people so authentically and in such an intimate setting of you could be doing anything listening to this podcast. Um, and I'm sure, you know, over all these episodes that both of you have, people have really gotten to know you and feel like they're kind of friends with you, right? So I think all of that together, just like, I think that's just such a great way to market and grow my career. So that was more of like, once I got into the genetic show, I'd podcast for like a year before that, um, doing a Hunger Games podcast. Um, <laughs> so once I, you know, figured out podcasting, I was like, all right, let me launch a genetic show be so that I could learn about genetics along with my audience. So that's really what these last 10 years have been. I started in high school, then went to college, got into a genetics program there, got into a grad school genetics program, and now I'm working full time as a genetic counselor. So it's kind of cool to see how things have changed over the last 10 years in genetics and just even within my own career in the last 10 years. Genetic counseling has been coming up a lot lately, right? I mean, because we've just recently had this big Roe versus Wade decision. Um, and, and I got to imagine, you know, you, you're already dealing with incredibly sensitive information for people. And now with Roe versus Wade, uh, you know, that's got to make it very complicated for some, you know, genetic counselors and people, uh, you know, right now. How, how's that working out? Yeah, it's definitely very layered, very complex, very disturbing that it was overturned, Roe was overturned. So I actually dove into this with one of my mentors, Laura Hersher. She came on episode 191 days after it happened. So she's really an expert on all this. So I, I you know, a lot of times interviews, I might know what guests are going to say. But for that one, I was like, I'm just going to ask her all the questions I want to know, and I'm sure the yeah. listeners are on the same page. So mm -hmm. I think for me, especially, I work in the prenatal area. So as a genetic counselor, you can work in a variety of areas of healthcare. I want to say almost all of them at this point. If it's not now, it will be in the near future. So prenatal is one of the biggest areas that genetic counselors work in. So I'm meeting with people that are pregnant or looking to conceive soon and going over genetic testing options, if they decide to do that, going over results, looking at family history, having these conversations about other testing options for termination of ending pregnancies. So when this happened, I was like, this is so relevant to me and my colleagues. I work out of New York or um, Connecticut. I'm right on the Connecticut, New York line. So I really serve people that are residents of both states. Mm -hmm. And so... Our laws have not changed. So Roe did not impact us in Connecticut and New York. And there's other states where it also didn't directly impact. So in Connecticut, someone can terminate a pregnancy up to 24 weeks and in New York up to 26 weeks. So I imagine as time goes on, I'm going to start getting patients from other states coming to me to be able to process this, this information and also to be able to make possibly a, a decision to end a pregnancy. Um, I imagine they're probably going to go to New York more than Connecticut because we're like a little bit further of a drive if you're coming from the South. But I'm sure we're going to see patients. And I really feel for genetic counselors that are working in states where there are abortion bans, where you it's very gray area. Can you even bring that up and bring it up that they could go to states like Colorado is known for being a state that you can have terminations that are past other states. So they're one of the states that it's a, a little bit longer for. Um, so there's just so much to talk about with it. And it's certainly something that we're constantly being updated, especially state by state. It's very hard to keep up with all 50 states, um, especially for these ones that are getting the trigger bans. I feel for people in that situation because <clears throat> before we had our, our last child, our, our son, uh, my wife had three miscarriages, right? And it was very hard. And one, one was sort of later term, you know, not very late term, not, you know, third trimester, sort of late term, first trimester. Um, but it was sort of long into the game and we had, you know, done the ultrasounds and, you know, all that stuff. But, you know, it just, I mean, and it turned out it was a genetic problem that, you know, made the fetus not non-viable. But, you know, like that, those times are really difficult for people. And, and like just, you know, working your way through that and, you know, all this expectation and then the loss. And it's just like, it's a traumatic event to start with. And, you know, to like ex draw, draw out that traumatic event, I just, I feel for anybody who's got to go through that because that's really tough. Yeah, it's really, really challenging for people. Oftentimes when I'm meeting them, this is one of the or the worst experiences of their life. So 
this is really heavy emotional time for them. And also to be able to process all of this information in terms of like genetics and will this happen again? And there's so many questions surrounding this. So there's a lot of layers. There's a reason why I'm called a genetic counselor because I'm going over the genetics, but I'm also counseling you. I'm not just going to be a robot and like teaching you. I'm also helping you to process some of those emotions as we're talking about this. And so it's certainly challenging. And another thing that I'm I'm very scared about with Roe that I want to learn more about, and I probably need to do another episode with Laura Hersher. So, you know, looking at there are certain procedures that when someone has a miscarriage, they may need a procedure after to clear out the pregnancy um, and to make sure that everything has been removed. I wonder if that's so that's something called a DNC or a DNE. So that's very fairly common for someone to have, especially if it wasn't like a chemical pregnancy where, say, you you pee on the pregnancy stick, it's positive, you go in, you go in for the blood test, and they say, oh, actually, I don't think you are pregnant. Like, okay, maybe you were pregnant for a week or two, right? Right. Um, So that's something I'm nervous about. Like, how is that? Is is that going to be affected at all? And also for something called ectopic pregnancies, where you have a pregnancy that is not in the uterus. So oftentimes that's like in the fallopian tube. And if that continues developing, your fallopian tube can rupture and cause a crazy amount of pain. And it's very, very dangerous. So that could be considered a termination, but it's a non-viable pregnancy that is putting that pregnant person's life into jeopardy. So there's so many different angles to talk about with it. And a lot of things that I think people should, you know, be aware of and try to keep up with if you can. Yeah. And you know, like you mentioned, chemical pregnancies. I mean, I don't know what this, I don't recall what the st- statistics were, but I remember that the m- vast majority of, you know, pregnancies in that regard, fertilization, you know, like 70, 80% of pregnancies actually are just never implant and they just kind of end up being heavy periods right. and things like that. And, and, you know, you probably wouldn't even know you're pregnant unless you were like tracking your cycle and you were taking pregnancy tests and you were trying maybe, but yeah, if, if you're not trying, then you might just be like, oh, my period was a couple days later, a week later or something. And you may not realize that, just just like you said, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's very, very complicated. It's very confusing for doctors, I think, is the biggest problem. You know, like, I think, you know, the there's there's always a disconnect between uh, the law and the, the people who, you know, that's their profession. And they understand sort of the, yes, the nuances of so it. Much. And I think that's... Like, pull in the experts. For whatever it is that you're talking about, pull in the experts that it affects that area of healthcare or education or whatever it is. We've gotten into, you know, very heady waters already. <laughs> but I know... Yes. We, but what it, we were talking uh, earlier before the, the show, and we were talking about a really fascinating thing that happens. And and I, I mentioned the idea of calico cats. Um, and for people who aren't, aren't familiar with calico cats, calico cats are white, reddish, and then black. And uh, they're only females. Only females are, are calico cats. And there's a really interesting story behind that that involves a lot of genetics. And there's a, there's a tie-in to people, too. Um, and so I thought that would be a really fun topic, you know, to have a conversation about. Could you tell us what is mosaicism? Oh, it's so interesting and so <laughs> cool. And it's the plot line of some science fiction shows that I've watched. I can't tell you what shows because that would ruin it <laughs> um, because it's like seasons into shows sometimes. Yeah. But it's so interesting. So mosaicism is when one organism, so we'll take me as an example, Say I had some cells that were different from other cells. So let's say this is not the case, but let's say in this alternate universe, I was I started out as a twin pregnancy, right? And maybe I had a brother in the womb. It's possible that I could have gotten some of my brother's stem cells while we were both developing together in the same pregnancy, and that could end up in my body. And so I could have some cells that are 46XY, typical male, and I could have some cells that are 46XX, which is probably primarily what I would have, which I have done my own karyotype. I do. Um, but <laughs> of course I have, right? Yes. Um, so it's really interesting that you can have two different cell lines in the same organism. 
And it's cool because sometimes when we go to do genetic testing, we may discover this for people. So I've had multiple colleagues share cases with me where something came up different with genetic testing. Maybe someone was pregnant and they were trying to figure out the sex of the baby based on genetics and chromosomes and something came up different. They're like, hmm, that doesn't really match. And they look a little bit more into it. And then it's possible that the pregnant person themselves, they were assigned female at birth, identify as female, and they find that they actually have some genetically male cells. And I feel like this is more common than we think, especially with the more testing we're able to do. It's popping up more and more. Mm -hmm. um, there's just so many different cool examples of mosaicism. And that's just one that I think of just being in the prenatal sector. Well, and also, I mean, the other thing that's interesting about it is sex is really determined by the hormones during development. So if you have uh, a, a male who's androgen resistant, they can be born with all the female anatomy, correct? Right. That they could be assigned female at birth, but if you look at their chromosomes, they're actually 46XY. So there's so many different layers of sex, too, that I think people don't really realize unless they've dived into it. Like, yes, you could base that off chromosomes. Also, hormones play a role. So when we're all developing, we kind of start as females. And then if there's certain hormones present that we can process, then we kind of can start developing those male parts. So it's it's interesting that there's so many different layers of it. And then, you know, obviously gender being separate from that. So there's just a lot of different aspects and ways that you can define sex and the intersex population as well. So right. I think it's it's not binary like people think. For the majority of population, sure. But there's a lot more exceptions than people realize, I think. Yeah, I mean, I heard, and I don't know if this statistic is right, you, you, you would be the best to know this, but I, I've heard Hopefully. that the the incidence of um, intersex births is equivalent to roughly the same amount as redheads that are born. Maybe. I know I was reading, I'm reading the book Middlesex right uh -huh. now, and they just quoted, which came out a long time ago, but I just got around to reading it. Um, and they quoted that one in 2,000 babies are born intersex. So that's what I read from that book. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head how common. I thought it was like maybe 1% of the population is redhead, but also it could be like point something. So 1% <laughs> would be like one in a 1,000. So I right. would say, yeah, that's a pretty close statistic, I would imagine. Well, yeah. I mean, and I think it's really interesting because you see redheads all the time, right? Right. You know, so you what I you don't so realize friends. is you're, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you still be friends. Well, and then there's, then there's also, I, I, I was watching a video of, 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 of someone who presented as female, but she was XXY, 46XXY, I guess is the thing. Is sure, that, Klein Felter syndrome. Yeah. And she yeah. actually had, she kind of had characteristics of both anatomies, but she was actually able to get pregnant, which I think is very rare in that, that situation. But yeah, usually for Kleinfelter's 47XXY, so you have like an extra sex chromosome compared yeah. to a typical, um, usually people present as male but can have infertility issues. Um, but there's certainly so many different types of chromosomal sex disorders. So, you know, could could be any, it could be triple X, um, you know, lo lots of different um, types. <laughs> How do you define a quality genetic test? As we know, genetic tests are not created equal. Different labs prioritize different aspects of testing. Blueprint Genetics has a patient-first mission. Giving a patient a result can help lead to better care. Blueprint Genetics has a team of people dedicated to sifting through this complex information so that results are thoroughly supported. With Blueprint, having human eyes on this data can help ensure it's valid. For patients that have been on the diagnostic odyssey for years, Having a pathogenic variant identified that was previously missed by other labs can be life-changing. Stay tuned for a full episode interview with Blueprint Genetics, where we define quality. We also want to hear from you. Email us at info at dnapodcast.com to share what quality genetic testing means to you. You can also head over to our social media and share. If you can't wait for this new episode with Blueprint Genetics, definitely go back and listen to episode 184, where we discussed inherited retinal disorders. You can also learn more at BlueprintGenetics.com. Again, that's BlueprintGenetics.com. Support for DNA Today comes from the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, also known as PETA, whose scientists have developed the Research Modernization Deal, a strategy to phase out ineffective experiments on animals with high-tech, state-of-the-art research. 
PETA has collected an abundance of evidence demonstrating that the use of animals in biomedical research hinders scientific progress and puts patients at risk. Learn more at PETA.org slash New Deal. Again, that's PETA.org slash New Deal. Perkinelle Genomics is a global leader in genetic testing, focusing on rare diseases, inherited disorders, newborn screening, and hereditary cancer. Testing services support the full continuum of care from preconception and prenatal to neonatal, pediatric, and adult. Testing options include sequencing for targeted genes, multiple genes, the whole exome or genome, and copy number variations. Using a simple saliva or blood sample, Perkinelmer Genomics answers complex genetic questions that can proactively inform patient care and end the diagnostic odyssey for families. Learn more at perkinelmergenomics.com. There's no way I'm the only one that's getting sick of Zoom conferences. <laughs> um, it's great to be able to talk with people from all over the world, but I have to say the in-person conference, there's nothing quite like it. So I'm really excited to be going to the Connecticut Genetic Counselors Association's first conference in person. Jackson Laboratory is gracious enough that they're going to be hosting us on Friday, October 14th, and they're in Farmington, Connecticut. So that's in the middle of Connecticut. Um, I'm honored to be moderating for the Roe versus Wade panel, where we're going to be discussing the implications for practicing in safe harbor state like Connecticut, New York, other states around us. Other presentation topics include polygenic risk scores, inclusive practice for LGBTQIA plus patients, billing, credentialing. We're packing a lot in. We also built in networking time so that we can meet you, chat, get to know each other. So really looking forward to this. There's a link in the show notes to register. Um, it's $25 if you're going for no, no CEUs, and then it's 50 if you're going for CEUs. Um, and it's three hours worth of CEUs. So pretty decent. Really hope I get to see you there. Well, and so, you know, getting back to the whole calico cat thing, right? So my my understanding of it, and I, you know, I'm a complete layperson, but when, when, when a female is born, the female gets an X chromosome from the mother and an X chromosome from the father. But which, chromo which X chromosome gets expressed in any given cell is sort of determined when the cells are initially dividing, correct? I mean, could you- Well could you, phrased, yes. Could you go into that. how that all works? Yeah, so this is something called um, X inactivation or activation. So for me, I have two X chromosomes. So only one of them is what we call active in a cell at a time. So while I was developing as you know an embryo, fetus, as, as that went on, basically some cells were like, okay, I'm going to turn my first X on. And some cells were like, I'm going to turn my second X on. And I forget exactly when that happens, but it's early enough along where you end up having like patches of your body be one X chromosome and patches that aren't, which patches, we're kind of getting to the cat situation here. <laughs> so I could like theoretically, maybe, you know, my left eye has my first X activated and, you know, cells on, you know, my right shoulder or something has my other X activated. So depending on what genes are present there, you could have a different presentation. And I think, as you mentioned, calico cats are like such a great, perfect example of this because from knowledge and what you mentioned, this is only females and it's because it depends on what X chromosome is activated. So you're literally seeing those patches so you can see the different, it's not cell line because it's all the same genetics that are present, but it's what chromosome is being turned on, what's active. And that's what you're seeing because I'm you know, assuming there's different... Um, just like we have our skin tones, like for cats, like fur color, there's different fur color genes there, I would imagine, that's, you know, making it white, orange, black, I think are like the, the different colors there. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting to see that. And I don't, and I'm thinking if there's three coat colors, do some of those cats have triple X? Like, I don't know. I, I'm not an expert on calico cats, <laughs> but that, that is the mechanism behind it. Well, they probably have both have some white in them or something, and 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 yeah, they maybe it's some kind of like mix or something. A, a black, yeah. I mean, right. it, 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 it's it's really fat. and and so by extension, um, the same would be true of all women, right? Are, right. are in some regard calico. So why wouldn't why wouldn't that sort of patchwork of of gene expression show up in humans like it does in cats? Yeah, like, why don't I have patches of skin that are more, like, lighter color <laughs> right, from, like, right. one parent, a little darker from the other? Like, yeah, you have one you know, Mediterranean and one Scandinavian parent. 
Right, right. Like my parents look, you know, they're they're pretty similar skin tone and everything. But for <laughs> other people, um, yeah, we don't really see that. It's more of a mix. Um, it might be because maybe, and I'm I'm kind of like guessing here. Um, it could be because genes that are related to our skin color maybe aren't on the X chromosome. Yeah. Like we don't have fur, right? Um, you know, at least most most humans don't. Some have more body hair than others, right? Well, that, that's but, another genetic condition. You know, that's for another all of your genetic body, thing. So. <laughs> yes, there's definitely one branch of my family that's hairier than the other branch. It's quite funny. <laughs> um, but yeah, maybe it's it's our skin color. And everything like related to our how much uh, melanin we produce, maybe that's on other chromosomes. I mean, something like height, that's very – there's hundreds of genes that play a role in that. I know that is a fact. But I would assume skin color is also lots and lots of genes. I don't know if it's hundreds, but I would – it's definitely more than one, obviously. Right. Otherwise, it would be a binary like you're either – you know, the first color, or the second color kind of thing. Right. Um, but maybe it's on a different chromosome. Maybe maybe that's why we don't really see patchwork on on 46XX people. <laughs> right. Well, and I think, you know, when you look at, you know, there are kids who are mixed race sure. and they just kind of are sort of a blend between the two in terms of skin color. So, you know, probably it's a lot more to it than just that. Yeah, like the multifactorial where we're looking at, like, you know, it also have to do with like with that. With height, it's more like, okay, also nutrition. You're not going to get to your maximum potential height if you're, you know, have malnutrients kind of thing. So there's definitely other things. That's what we consider epigenetics when we have genetics and environment interacting with each other, which is such an interesting area. But I mean, I, I, I will just constantly lead you into tangents. So please. <laughs> well, I mean, epigenetics is a really on. interesting thing, but we may have to have another it podcast is. for that because we that's might. We super might. cool. Yes. I mean, the the, uh, the idea that like you're not just your your genes that are, are, are making the determination, but just how they're expressing, how you're how the proteins are folded. There's so much variation. It's really fascinating. Yeah. When we're talking about this, sort of the X and the Y, you know, w one thing you mentioned to me that I thought was really fascinating and I wasn't aware of is, you know, I always joke that, you know, like men... <laughs> men don't live as long because we have that broken chromosome, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it just it makes us do like really dumb things. And, you know, that's why- You, know, you said it, not me, Chris. So, all right. That's why we have these broken <laughs> chromosomes that leads us to bad decisions. Um, but what you were saying is you were, you had a patient one time, you were looking at their genetics and you noticed they had a missing X chromosome. This was really interesting. So as a student- um, I worked in a laboratory, a cytogenetics lab. So I basically all day would sit in front of a microscope and be looking at cells and analyzing the chromosomes in those cells. So that's what we've been talking about. Like 40, I keep saying 46XX, 46XY or variants of that. Um, 46, like we have 46 chromosomes, 23 from mom, 23 from dad, or 23 from the egg, 23 from the sperm, I should say. Um, and, you know, what I learned is, you know, looking at this patient, you know, I never met the patient because, again, I'm in the lab, but, you know, see that it's an older gentleman and, um, you know, he has some kind of cancer. So we're looking to see, like, okay, what are the changes in his chromosomes? Is there anything we can identify so we can help diagnose what type of cancer it might be specifically? And sometimes that can help with treatments and everything. So as I'm going through, I'm looking at the cells, a bunch of them are missing the Y chromosome. And so for anyone that's looked under a microscope at it, sometimes a cell will just kind of um, kind of go AWOL and you got to look for it. <laughs> so maybe it's like way off. So think about like alphabet soup. You might, if you have a really big bowl, you might have one letter like all the way at the edge of the bowl. So that's basically what I was doing. So I'm looking for this Y chromosome and I'm like not finding it. I'm like, all right, I'm hitting other cells. So that's not it. Um, and then I asked them and they're like, oh, that's really common for um, people that have a Y chromosome to lose that as they age, like over time. And that kind of blew my mind a little bit because I'm like, we're just losing chromosomes as we get older. Like, is that part of aging? Like all these questions popped up for me. Um, and it's just interesting that that's, that's a natural phenomena that happens in biology. I don't know if that happening with females, uh, for that have two X chromosomes. Um, uh, but I've only heard of this for the Y and it, it is the tiniest chromosome. So you wonder, right. is that part of it? It's hard, it's hard to, you know, keep attached to it, tether it and, and have it, um, you know, passed down to the, the daughter cells, the future cells as cells divide. Um, but yeah, it was just so interesting to learn. And maybe that explains boomers. Maybe. Don't come at no me with idea. hate. I'm almost a boomer. <laughs> I'm on the cusp of boomerism. I probably right, have no right. X left at this point. <laughs> From like a 
a guy who doesn't know very much about genetics, I haven't really thought about it, and I don't think about it on a day-to-day basis, but now you're getting me to think about things. What what would like an average person um, who doesn't really follow genetics, what is like the biggest curiosity that people have about themselves from a genetics perspective? I have so many people ask, like, especially being in the prenatal setting, they're like, off topic question, but like, can you figure out what color eyes my child would have or like certain traits? Mm -hmm. And I think from like high school, middle school biology, you know, well-intentioned, but sometimes high school teachers can kind of make things a little simpler than they actually are, which (laughs) is tough, right? Because it's high school level. You just want to get kids, you know, engaged with science. But um, it's not as simple, just like we were talking about for other conditions that there can be hunt, like, you know, lots of genes that play a role in some of these conditions. There are some condition, uh, some traits that are very simplistic though, that are caused by one gene. So one thing as an example would be like people that have a widow's peak. So you can kind of see for people watching video, like I have a little bit of a widow's peak here where it kind of comes down. Like, you know, it's not quite, you know, vampire level where it's like really (laughs) deep, (laughs) but um, that would be a trait that I'm sure if I looked at my parents, at least one of them has that. And that's how I inherited that. Sundish and I, I think, you know, the chance for a widow's peak is long past us. <laughs> we'd, have, we'd have to, uh, I don't we'd know, have to go back in time is, to is find quite it. nice had a hair there. But um, <laughs> another one is if you have attached earlobes or not. So I don't have attached earlobes. So I have like, you know, um, they're, they're not, you know, attached. Um, so when I look at my parents, both of them have detached earlobes as well. Um, and I forget exactly the inheritance pattern for that, which is dominant, which is recessive. But there's certain things that as you go through, even if you can roll your tongue, like that's something that's genetic. Can you guys do that? I can do that. And I can do puffer tongue You can tongue do that. Too. What about you, Sundish? Yeah, yeah, you got it. There you go. <laughs> yeah, nice. I've heard that's genetic. So there's certain things that are I that can simplistic. do the eyebrow thing too, which is apparently- The eyebrow thing. Yeah, I don't- No, they're moving together. That's not happening for me. Um, So there's some things that are controlled by like one gene. So simplistic, that's what we call Mendelian genetics, Mm. uh, honoring Gregor Mendel, who made, you know, major advancements back in the 1800s. Um, But it was his work was rediscovered. He's the pea plant guy, the wrinkled, smooth, all that. Um, (laughs) So, yeah, I would say that that's what people say. And then. They get into like designer babies and I'm like, well, that's not quite what I do (laughs) at all, but you know, we could talk about how that could be something in the future. Um, so then some people, you know, we talk about that and I'm like, oh my gosh, time for the next patient. Like I got to go, but this is so interesting. So So with all this genetic, you know, research that you do, you have a show, so you get all this great information. What, is there something that you get really excited about or passionate about? Like the next innovation of genetics? Like what, what is it that really gets you pumped up? Yes. Oh my gosh. There's so many to pick from, but I would say the interviews that I've been most excited about recently and what I've been kind of looking at and keeping up with since, you know, 2012 or so, since the show started really is CRISPR. Mm. Um, Have you guys heard of CRISPR before? I have. Very cool stuff. Yeah. So let me, should I give like kind of a background on what it is for people that don't know? Explain it because I'm sure a lot of people have not heard of CRISPR. Sure. I'm like, yeah, I'm not talking about like crispy food like (laughs) or like the CRISPR in your fridge. Um, So CRISPR is an acronym. We discovered it. It naturally occurs in bacteria. It's basically bacteria's immune system. So that when bacteria interacts with a virus, the bacteria can be like, wait a minute, I've seen this virus before. I remember it let me fight it off because this isn't part of me as a bacteria. This this is an invader. What they're able to do is chop up that virus and take a little piece of the DNA from that virus and put it into their own DNA so that they'll remember it and recognize that in the future. So it that's a lot for bacteria. Like I remember when I was reading this, this landmark paper back in 2012, I was like, wow, like, you know, bacteria able to do all this. Like we think of bacteria as being very simple, but not necessarily. So we discovered this. And then we said, well, why don't we take this this idea and turn it into a technology where we could take our own DNA and basically use this CRISPR like molecular scissors. So if you're picturing like a DNA strand, like a piece of yarn, and you're taking scissors, you're cutting out a piece of it. So you take that tiny little piece of yarn out, and then you put a new color piece of yarn in, and you tape it back up. 
that's basically what CRISPR can do to your DNA. So we can take out a section of DNA that maybe has a pathogenic variant or mutation, as some people call it, and then we can replace it with DNA that doesn't have that spelling error, that doesn't have a mutation, so that theoretically a person wouldn't be affected by whatever that mutation would do in their body. So this is a really cool concept that could theoretically cure a lot of genetic conditions. And over the last 10 years, it's been very exciting to see how much we have come from just this concept to we've got Nobel Prize winners that worked on this CRISPR technology. And now we have clinical trials going for certain disorders to see, like, can we actually do this and help people in the medical setting? That's a lot to happen in, in 10 years. That's a, it's a huge, and, and it's super interesting stuff. And and I know that, like, you can now, you know, even there's there's labs where you can, you know, engineer, you know, bits of DNA from scratch, and they'll they'll build it for you. Um, but you know, the thing that's that I've been hearing in the news most recently is, uh, well, one, you know, like treating cancer and thing like things like that is a big big one using CRISPR to, you know, customize genetic you know, immuni Im immuni immunology uh, for, um, you know, certain cancer patients specific to their genetics. Um, but the other one that I've been hearing a lot about is, uh, you know, a CRISPR solution for heart disease, too. Um, I don't know if you, you're familiar with any of those projects. You could speak to them a little bit. Yeah. So I was just reading up on a Nature article the other day, which is like a, a really huge scientific um, uh, publication journal. And it's really cool that they've started these, um, you know, and I'm not remembering the group. We'll have to include a link in the show notes um, for a group that is doing a clinical trial for an inherited form of having high cholesterol that can then lead to heart disease. Mm. So we're not talking right now is the key word here, but we're not talking right now about heart disease in general, right? That would be that will be monumental when we're right. able to do more interventions with that and and prevention, mm -hmm. cure, like those big words. But right now, where things start is usually with very specific like genetic conditions, because if we can fix that, and I put that in air quotes because, you know, are we really fixing someone? I don't know. But if we can correct that mutation, can we prevent that person from having high cholesterol and that associated increased risk to develop heart disease. So there's this condition is called familial hypercholesterolemia, which I don't know if I quite pronounced <laughs> that right, but I, I got close. So people that have this condition, they have one letter in their DNA that's different. So just like we talked about before, this is a Mendelian disease. So the gene is called PCSK9. And so if we could do what I talked about and take out basically that wrong base pair, the wrong letter, and put in the right letter, theoretically, we would cure that person of having FH. And that would prevent them from having the inherited high cholesterol and the associated increased risk for heart disease. So it's really exciting to see this because this is even a little bit different and a little bit more on, as we've seen CRISPR technology evolve, it's a little bit even further on that evolving because we don't even need those molecular scissors to necessarily cut the DNA. We can kind of swap out the bases without having to do that cutting part, um, which I've, I've seen a little bit more about recently. Um, so it's really interesting to see like are we going to be able to do this? How is the clinical trials going to look? So I think that's something that, especially if you're listening to this and, you know, maybe it's we recorded this a year ago or something, right? Like, go and see what's happening right now with clinical trials with this, because if we've had success, then it's just going to lead to more clinical trials and much more of this testing. <laughs> Did you know Perkin Elmer Genomics was one of the first laboratories to offer whole genome sequencing on a clinical basis? Whole genome sequencing can maximize clinical diagnostic yield for patients. With turnaround time of four weeks for the proband sample, Perkin Elmer's whole genome sequencing test is designed to provide access to additional valuable information compared to an exome. Perkin Elmer also offers prenatal whole genome sequencing as well as ultra rapid whole genome sequencing for critically ill newborns using dried blood spots. The ultra-rapid genome has a turnaround time of five days and includes mito, chromosomal CNB analysis, STR-TNR screening, and biochemical analysis. 
Also, listen back to episode 176 with Dr. Maduri Hegda, where we explore the power of whole genome sequencing, which also happens to be one of my favorite episodes of DNA Today. And stay tuned for a couple more episodes with Perkin Elmer soon. Discover all that Perkin Elmer Genomics has to offer at perkinelmergenomics.com. This is a shocking statistic. The National Institutes of Health, or NIH, the world's largest funder of biomedical research, squanders an estimated $200 billion of taxpayer money every year on ineffective animal experiments for human diseases. The NIH reports that failure rates for novel drugs occur in about 95% of human studies, despite showing success in preclinical experiments using animals. Animals and humans deserve better which is why scientists for the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, aka PETA, have developed new strategies for replacing the use of animals in experiments with human-relevant methods. Advances in human-relevant research technologies hold tremendous promise to revolutionize biomedical research and usher in the age of personalized medicine, a topic we explore extensively on DNA Today. Head over to PETA.org slash New Deal to learn more. Again, that's PETA.org slash New Deal. When it comes to the quality of genetic testing, the most important aspect to consider is patient care. At Blueprint Genetics, patients come first. In order for a test to be considered high quality, it should provide valuable information for the patient. That's why Blueprint Genetics is focused on prioritizing quality and delivering answers to patients and their families. Stay tuned for our interview with Blueprint Genetics, where we will define what quality genetic testing means. In the meantime, you can learn more at BlueprintGenetics.com. Again, that's BlueprintGenetics.com. How do you, how do you administer something like that, and how does it propagate through the body? I mean, you know, like uh, there's so, a difference between editing one cell, but you got to get it to the rest of the cells to kind of make that work. Right. Yeah, I'm curious how they're doing it for this type of clinical trial. I know for sickle cell how it works. Oh. So for sickle cell, that's um, a blood disorder. Yeah. So usually people's red blood cells look like donuts and they're nice and round and healthy. People that have sickle cells, their red blood cells are like in a sickle shape. So kind of like a, like, um, a quarter moon shape. And because of that, it's not able to go through our blood vessels as swiftly and smoothly. So sometimes there gets to be a bunch of these sickle cells. That's why it's called sickle cell. A bunch of these cells accumulate, and then they can cause pain when they're they're constricting blood flow. So for this, the way that blood cells are created in our body is from our bone marrow, So if you can do a bone marrow transplant of Mm. cells that have been corrected with this CRISPR, so you take the bone marrow cells from that patient, you you fix them in the lab, you CRISPR them up, and then you put them back into the person. So it's a bone marrow transplant, but of their own cells. So I don't know what that would, an auto something probably called. So then once it's back in them, the sickle cell mutation is not there. So then their bone marrow just starts producing healthy red blood cells. So for that, it's a little bit easier because you take the cells out of the body, fix them, and then put them back in. Mm. But other disorders, I don't know how it's going to work or what they're doing for FH or other disorders like cystic fibrosis, where your lungs are mostly affected. We can't just take your lungs out, fix them, and put them back in with the cells. Very different. So it makes sense that like the first clinical trials that I'm aware of, we're starting with sickle cell because... It's it's an easier way to start doing it and seeing what are the success rates and all of that. Um, but it's definitely harder once it's like you can't take it from someone, fix it, and put it back in. So that's where we start getting concerned about off-target effects and, and different things with that. Do you ever imagine that like some of these will become germline, you know, kind of changes? So it's already happened. So oh, really? in yeah, December November, December of 2018. Um, I woke up in the morning, checked my phone, like always, and I see that there's this big announcement that a researcher out in China had edited human embryos with CRISPR, put them, and then took those embryos and implanted them into a person. And that pregnancy came to term for two twin girls, and they're born, and for all we know, they are alive and well today. So... You know, there were so many conversations, especially the years leading up to that, of like, you know, what what should we do? We need to have like these world consortiums where we have bioethicists speak and, and talk about, 
you know, laws and different things we should do to prevent this from happening. And he literally announced this the night before he was going to be presenting at a CRISPR conference that I can't remember. I know it was like somewhere around in Asia. I'm forgetting exactly where the conference was. But so it was like very, very dramatic, very controversial. Um, He was punished. He just got out of jail. It's, it's been, what, four years now. So I think he was in jail for about three and a half years, something like that. Um, So scary because it's already happened. And we don't know, as I said, like those off-target effects. Like right. the gene that he targeted – Okay, he claims that it was edited properly, but did that CRISPR accidentally cut other areas of the DNA, cause other mutations we don't know about? There's so many questions with that. It's a lot to look at. Yes. So I worry about the health for those two twins, and I believe there was another pregnancy, a singleton, so one baby, um, that hasn't really been talked about in the media. Um, so it's, it's scary. I'm not aware of any others that have happened since, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are ones that have happened that the media just hasn't picked up. Yeah. And so I would imagine since it's uh, working on an embryo and replacing basically that genetic sequence within the entire embryo, that would be passed on to future generations. Yes, in that regard, exactly. Right? So that's something that, you know, when I'm talking about like the uh, patients that have sickle cell that go through bone marrow transplant, all that, their children are not inheriting those changes because we're not changing their sperm, we're not changing their eggs. Right. But as Chris brought up, if you're changing embryos, then all of their eggs, all of their sperm, and all of the subsequent generations are going to be affected. So it doesn't just die with that person. You are now passing that on. That gene is now in our human population, which that's like the most scary part. Thank you for highlighting that because somehow I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's just so interesting. And I, I think, you know, solving uh, sickle cell, a friend of my daughter's has sickle cell and it's, it's horrible. It's a horrible disease. It's, it's a really tough illness. Extremely painful, extremely yes. painful. The poor kid. I mean, you know, cause you know, he's a kid growing up with that and, it, you know, he's always end up at the hospital, you know, trying to get painkillers and, you know, it's, it's tough. Um, well, Kira, we def, I definitely want <laughs> want to have you back on because you know I'm what now, like everything every time i talk to you i think about like 10 other things i want to talk to you about <laughs> right? and like you know the whole epigenetics thing and all that and just how genes are so expressed cool. and all that we gotta we gotta come back and have a conversation about that sometime that sounds great that's yeah because people cool. like i used to say to people like oh yeah i have a genetics podcast and and once people got to the point where they knew what a podcast was and i have to explain oh it's an internet radio show right <laughs> they'd be like how can you talk about genetics for a half hour and i'm like oh how God. can i only talk about genetics for a half hour like <laughs> How can I cut myself off? Um, so yeah, that's that's such more a of my such issue. a cool topic. Such a cool topic. Yeah, well, Kira, yeah. you know, thanks so much uh, for being on. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, you know, go vote for Kira. She's up for another uh, podcast award. Uh, yeah, as are we, hopefully. You. We'll see. Yes. Um, yes. I saw you guys were on the list. Yeah, we were, we were on you the list. You guys were in the tech category, right? We're in the tech category. So we're not competing. Yes, because I was so. going to say, I'm pretty sure I voted for you. And I'm like, unless right. I did that by accident, I voted against me. But I was no. like, no. like No, because I voted yes, for you right. and you voted for me. It's perfect. Yes, exactly. Yes. And, That's and what we got to do as everybody podcasters. Everybody else in the audience should go and do that, too. I don't know if the voting's open yet. <laughs> That was just yeah, the nomination so the, period. the nominations ended July 31st. And then if you did nominate, you might be selected as one of the voters during August. So, um, yeah, keep your eye on your email and definitely confirm your nomination. So you'll get an email. If you don't confirm, it doesn't count. So, yeah. All right. Yes. Well, we got to we got to get the, get that all done. Well, Kira, <laughs> thanks so much for being on. I really uh, love your podcast. Uh, where, where can they find your podcast? Yeah, so any podcast player, you can just search DNA Today. We're the green logo. And you can also head over to our website, dnatoday.com. We have all episodes. Um, depending when this episode comes out, we might have hit our 200th oh, wow. um, slash our 10th anniversary birthday. So that's crazy. Kind of wild. My baby's 10, as I said. No, wow. That's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. Yes. Be but very thank proud. you so much, Sundish and Chris, for having me on. This was really fun. I'd be very happy to come back on. Oh, awesome. awesome. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks for tuning in. I'd love to hear from you in the comments. And if you like what you saw, give us a like. Think about subscribing because that's really the best way to help this channel. And I will see you in the next one. For more information about today's episode, visit dnapodcast.com, where you can also stream all episodes of the show. We encourage your questions, comments, guest pitches, and ideas. Send them all into info at dnapodcast.com. 
Search DNA Today on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, so you can connect with us there. And a favor, please rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This truly helps us climb the charts and allow more genetic nerds like yourself to find the show. DNA Today is hosted and produced by myself, Kier Deneen. Our social media lead is Corinne Merlino. Our video lead is Amanda Andrioli. Thanks for listening and join us next time to discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. DNA.